Okay, we've got a um, on your screen to say uh, the question box. Also, um, you may or may not know, but we actually run open days and master classes here in Teddington where you can actually meet Alistair and the other trainers that we've got, meet our product experts and actually get your hands on the equipment. And it's fortunate for you guys that we have a Sony Large Sensor Masterclass, which is on Wednesday the 9th of December. Alistair will be going through that as well, and it will be Alistair who will be running the Masterclass. So if um, what you hear today is um, of value and you want to actually meet Alistair or you want to actually get your hands on the FS5 or the FS7 and go through it in, in much, much more detail, it's a whole day Masterclass, then please go to our website, www.visuals.co.uk, slash events and you'll be able to register then and have more details and it really is um we've done these master classes with Alistair before and they're always oversubscribed so please get in early yeah, do come along they're, they're normally really uh, informative and uh, we normally get really good feedback from them everyone seems to get, get a lot out of them so sure yeah people are always emailing me and uh, you know requesting more so uh, please get in early if you don't want to be disappointed as i say in all those good adverts um, before we get started, I, I just want to do a quick poll. Um, it would just help Alistair to know exactly the profile of the audience and um, where we are. So um, There is no video for this, uh, by the way. Somebody's asked about video for this. It's an audio-only webinar, so uh, there is no video. You're not missing anything. No, I mean, you will get the slides, obviously, but it will be accompanied by an audio. Um, um, uh, side by side. So, in terms of the poll, uh, have you made the leap to 4K recording yet? So, if you could, wouldn't mind just um, looking at you know the options you've got. Yes, already there. No, but almost there. No, but I know we need to. Or number four, not convinced of the benefits yet, which is fair enough. So, if you would like to just look at the poll and give us some um, op options so that we can, as I said, just adjust. The profile because clearly if everyone's so, not convinced so get, get your answers in there nice and quick because we're a little limited for time today um so we'll try and get through this stuff as quick as we can to get on to the main sure. uh, presentation okay i think just a few more left and it looks as though that there's actually a minority who've already made the leap so that's quite interesting and quite a few are almost there which you know um, which is fair enough i think Sessions like this that you can get on the website or, as I say, um, attending an event or a masterclass will just help you either confirm that, that is the way to go or, in fact, you know, for what you do, you don't need to. Mm. So I think that's, that's a, you know, just as relevant as well. So I think there's an, an awful lot of people who've got 35% no, but almost there. And I think that's pretty, pretty much what I experience everywhere I go is that most people sure. are aware of it, know about it, looking at it. I mean, an RM a little bit about it because obviously there's workflow implications, but most people can see the benefits at least of shooting in 4K, but they just perhaps need to sort out the workflow first. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys, for that. Uh, we'll just close it now. Um, and as I say, you can obviously still um, put questions through on, on the question box. And um, now I'll hand over to Alistair, who will start the presentation. Yes, so get those questions coming in uh, nice and quick, because it does take a little while for them to filter through to us, and we'll answer them as we go, as, as many of them as we can. Um, okay, so um, first of all, I don't work for Sony. Um, I'm a Sony independent certified expert, so I have a very close working relationship with Sony. I'm a freelance cameraman and I shoot a lot of things, uh, natural um, extremes in particular, northern lights, hurricanes, tornadoes, things like that. Lots of pictures of the camera here, FS5, but I'm quite sure you've already seen them on various websites and things like that, so I'm not going to dwell on pictures of the camera. Um, so what is it? It's a large sensor, super 35 millimeter camera, nice big sensor, big pixels, big photo sites. Um, that, um, that means that uh, you can really sort of get good dynamic range, very good sensitivity, good low light performance, very similar to the FS700 in many respects, 240 frames per second slow motion. And of course, um, it does have 4K or, or more specifically the UHD option. Now, what makes the FS5 different from other cameras is its size. It's very small and very light. Most people are really, um, surprised about how light the camera is and it has 
a uh, variable ND filter, which I'll talk about in a bit, very low power consumption, and the ability to record in log. Um, what the FS5 is not, and this is really important, is it's not a fully featured digital cinema camera. It isn't simply a small FS7 or a small FS5. It's got things missing from it that, that mean it can't do what those cameras can do. Um, as an example, um, the viewfinder doesn't have a true LUT as such. It has a gamma conversion process. So it gives you the correct contrast in the viewfinder, but the colors are still flat when you're shooting in log. Um, there's no Cine EI mode, so uh, altering your ISO or your exposure index is much, much harder with this camera. And in HD, it's only UHD. So it's 3840 by 2160 only, and that's 8-bit 42. There's no 10-bit 42 in UHD. And again, 30 frames per second maximum. So quite a few limitations in the UHD area. They're not necessarily all bad, though. 8-bit is not the devil. A lot of people go, oh, God, it's 8-bit. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. 8-bit is not bad. And you can shoot logs successfully with 8-bit. You just have to be a lot more careful and expose it exactly right. And actually, that means exposing it one to two stops above the recommended um, levels for S-Log2 or S-Log3. But what the FS5 really is, is an excellent run and gun large sensor camera. It is superb for run and gun. You have the kit lens that comes with it, the 18 to 105 or 104, I can't remember, um, power zoom lens and nice smooth zooms from the hand grip directly. You have a usable autofocus system um, with one push auto and face tracking and things like that. You have this amazing variable ND filter. So even if you're using Canon lenses, which have a very steppy aperture, you can still make perfectly smooth exposure changes on the run. You have super slow-mo, which is like the FS700 with a cache type system if you want. And it really is well designed ergonomic. It really does sit in your hand very nicely. The center of gravity of the camera runs right away through the middle of the camera. So it doesn't tend to want to lean forwards or lean backwards. Um, more slides here of the camera, really. It's, uh, you, you can see that the LCD panel um, is really nicely arranged. It's actually mounted to the camera with a standard quarter inch threaded screw, so you can move it. You can put it on the left side, the right side, the front, the back, almost anywhere on the camera. And that makes it very simple, very fast, and easy camera to use. The hand grip, very similar to the one on the FS7. One of the nice th things that they've done with the hand grip is it's very quick to remove, very one button push and it unlocks when the camera comes off. It's very secure on the camera, it doesn't wobble, doesn't vibrate. And you can replace or add to the Sony mounting a standard Arri rosette. And by adding an Arri rosette to the hand grip itself or to the camera body, you can use all the different Arri arms and things like that to mount the hand grip remote from the camera if you choose. You can also use the Sony FS7 arm if you want. And because it's standard LANC protocol, the remote control protocol is LANC, um, you can extend that cable. It's very short, the one on the FS7. With a cable you can buy from a local Maplin or electronics store for just a few pounds. Very cheap, very easy um, to extend that to use it, um, especially actually with gimbals. Um, because the camera is so light, it lends itself to use on gimbals. And you can extend the cable for the hand grip and then, then mount the hand grip on the handle of your gimbal to control the camera remotely. And in addition, the viewfinder cable is also, it's about half a meter long. And because it's a quarter inch mounting thread on the viewfinder, you can also put the viewfinder on the handle of your gimbal. So it really keeps the light and the weight really down. Being designed to be used outdoors in rain, in snow, stuff like that, it's not waterproof. Don't go using it in torrential rain, things like that. But the electronics are inside the camera, protected from the exterior there. The fan, there is a fan in the camera, passes air over a heat sink that cools a central box central area where the circuit boards are so they're reasonably well protected from water and dust and snow and rain and stuff like that. You're still going to need a rain cover for, for use in heavy rain but it's not too bad. Um, lens options, Sony E-mount. And one of the great things about E-mount is you can put just about any lens that you want onto it because we can adapt to just about anything from Nikon, PL, Canon, um, almost anything. I really haven't found a lens that you can't put on an E-mount uh, camera, so you have a huge amount of questions. 
Now, one thing I want to look at very quickly is the variable ND filter. So this is a new filter system for a large sensor camera. It's actually been used on the X180, X160 cameras already, and it's you know, well regarded. It doesn't reduce your image quality at all. You have a clear position, and when the camera filter wheel is set to clear, it is clear. There is nothing between the lens and the sensor. When you bring in that first position on the ND filter wheel, you have a degree of ND, and you have three amounts of ND, and you can adjust what each of those ND positions on the filter wheel is in the menu, so you can have how much ND you want. But as well as using the filter wheel as you would do traditionally, you can also um, adjust variably the ND filter, so you can make it darker or less dark using a wheel on the side of the camera to have a fully variable ND filter system, and that works really very well indeed. And that allows you to uh, control your exposure. So as a, a really good example of using it is coming from indoors to outdoors. Say you're following somebody with a traditional camera. As they walk outside, you're going to have to stop down the lens to keep the exposure correct. And the depth of field of the shot is going to change hugely. Inside, shallow depth of field, big aperture. Outside, small aperture, very, um, uh, very uh, uh, deep depth of field, everything in focus. So that, with the ND filter though, you, instead of controlling with the aperture, you control your exposure with the ND. So as you move outside, you stop down the ND, and then that controls your exposure, but without changing the depth of field, the shot doesn't look any different outside to inside, and that's a really nice thing. Now, we do have some questions, so I'm going to start going through some of these questions before we uh, move on. Um, one of the questions that's been asked, and this is important actually, is out of the box, when you get your FS5s, they're supposed to be shipping in the next week or so. Last I heard, they should be coming in by the end of the month, so it's really imminent. Um, is out of the box, you won't be able to get an HDMI output from the camera when you're shooting and recording internally in the camera. Um, this is going to be resolved with the first release, version 1.1 of the firmware. So initially, when you're recording with the camera, nothing will come out of the HDMI connector uh, as soon as you hit record. Uh, when you're not recording, you will get an output. Version 1.1 will resolve that, it will fix that, so that when you're recording internally on the camera, there will still be an output on the HDMI or the SDI. You can't have HDMI and SDI, you can have HDMI or SDI out, um, but there'll always be a picture on the LCD monitor on the camera, that doesn't cut off at all, that's always going to have a picture. So you will be able to have a picture on the LCD and either HDMI or SDI out with version 1.1. With version 1, the firmware that's in the camera initially, then when you hit record, the HDMI output is going to cut off. Um, other questions, uh, bit rates, um, 100 megabits per second in UHD, 50 megabits per second in HD with XAVCL. Uh, remember, it's all long got codecs. You are going to need quite a good computer to be able to handle this. You also have a um, 35 megabit XAVC in HD, and also there's also proxy um, mode. So you can actually shoot um, a proxy at the same time as shooting your full resolution file, and that proxy can then be uploaded via FTP because uh, the camera has built-in Wi-Fi and a built-in LAN connection and you can stream that or upload it via FTP. So you can shoot full res and a proxy simultaneously. Uh, that is a really nice function in, in HD. Um, why is there not much information on broadcast standards? Um, because in basically in UHD, this is not a broadcast camera. The bit rate, it's a 8-bit 420 4K or UHD camera, and that's not really gonna cut it for 4K or UHD broadcast. UHD and 4K is all about quality, and it's gonna to have to be 10 bit 422, and you can't do that with this camera. In HD, no problem at all, 50 megabit per second, XAVCL is broadcast quality, it's 10 bit 422 in HD, no worries whatsoever, really good camera for HD broadcast, but not for, as a main primary camera for UHD um, 4K type productions. As always, when you're doing a 4K production, there will be an allowance where you can use a 
lower standard camera for up to 20% of the production in most cases. And in that case, this would be a great camera for getting those covert shots or, or maybe shooting inside a car, things like that, when you can't use um, a mainstream camera. Um, so, you know, it's not the end of the world. Um, other questions? Um, yes, the viewfinder can be removed. Um, it's actually the same connection as the FS7 viewfinder. You can use the FS7 viewfinder if you wish. Um, can you add another viewfinder? Yes, FS7 mm -hmm. viewfinder yeah. can be added. Um, or there are third party already um, eyepieces and monoculars that are coming out that will go on to the screen that's available on this camera. But don't forget, of course, you've got a really good high quality OLED viewfinder on the back of the camera as well. It's a really surprisingly good little camera. It's small, but it is very good. Any other lenses uh, that can control with LANK? Well, only Sony lenses, only Sony lenses have the electronic zoom function that can be controlled via LANK. So if you want that electronic zoom control, you're going to have to use a Sony lens, a Sony E-mount lenses. Sony E-mount lenses are generally really good, and one benefit of using Sony lenses on this camera is it has correction for any image artifacts in the lens, so any vignetting any chromatic aberration, things like that. So when you put a Sony lens on there, very often the lenses appear to perform much, much better than perhaps they would otherwise. A dynamic range, it's 14 stops. This is the same sensor as the FS5, FS7 camera. So it has that full 14 stops of dynamic range when you're shooting with S-Log2 or S-Log3. Okay, uh, right, more questions. So lens-wise, just to go back over that basically, the only lenses that can be controlled over LAN, over Wi-Fi, or um, using the LAN control will be Sony E-mount lenses. You will be able to control the aperture of third-party lenses like Canon lenses if you're using an electronic lens controller. So if you've got something like a Metabones adapter to control your Canon lens and it has um, electronic iris, you will be able to control those lenses. But just remember that um, and I, uh, um, uh, the aperture in our Canon lens goes in steps, a little bit steppy. Um, computer requirements, it is important. Um, a good iMac will handle XAVCL if you've got the right graphics card. You are going to have to have a high spec computer. You're going to have to use a really good computer. XAVCL is a long got codec, it does require a lot of processing power. And you need both a good CPU and a good graphics card. You need a good CPU to decode the codec, because that's done in the CPU. And then you need a good graphics card to handle any effects or filters that you add to your clips, because that's done by the graphics card. I edit XAVCL on my laptop, which is a um, latest generation Retina MacBook Pro. And it's fine, it's great, but you can't do lots and lots of different streams. You, you really need... Uh, a, a good uh, computer for this uh, particular codec. Um, Nikon lenses, yes, you can use APS-C Nikon lenses, um, but you, there's nobody that makes an electronic controller for Nikon lenses, so you cannot use any of the electronic functions. So no iris, no electronic iris control, no autofocus, no steady shot, none of that with Nikon lenses. Canon lenses, again, Metabones adapter, that will give you aperture control electronically, and it will give you image stabilization but you won't have autofocus, no autofocus with Canon lenses. Um, the variable ND filter and its reaction time, it's almost instant. It works really fast. Um, th there's no delay. So if you're using the, the dial on the hand grip or if you've assigned it to a LAN controller or something like that, there, there really isn't any delay. Um, I'm, I've only got four minutes left, I'm afraid, folks. I'm going to rattle through more questions yeah, to try yeah, and... Yeah, not the, the, uh, okay. okay. All right, we're not... Okay, we, we've got a timer. We'll, we'll, I'm going to get as much in in the next four minutes, but it may well go beyond four minutes. Um, how does it compare to the C300 for Obdoc shooting for broadcast? I think it's going to be a fantastic camera for Obdoc shooting. It's lightweight, it's small, it's compact, portable, face tracking, really good autofocus. You have log, you have um, the viewfinder assist. I think the ergonomics are better than the C300. I really don't like the way the C300 viewfinder is mounted, but that's a personal thing. Really, you have to pick up the camera, hold it in your hand, and try it for yourself. 
Uh, can you upload direct from the camera to a backup drive? No, you can't. You are going to need a computer or some other way to do it. But hey, it's only SD cards. SD cards are so cheap these days. SD XC required for 4K. So buy more cards. They're like 25 quid for a, a 32 gig card. Then they're not at all expensive. It's almost cheaper than tape now to use SD cards. So you really, you know, just just get lots of cards would be my response to that. How well matches the pictures of the band of the FS7? It's very, very close, but it isn't identical. This camera has different processing to the FS7, and that's one of the things that's enabled Sony to get the power consumption right down. A BPU-60 battery will run this camera for close to four hours, so two BPU-60s are probably most, most people, all most people will need for a full day's shoot. Um, will there be a center scan option with the software upgrade? I have no idea with this camera. Uh, it does, well, actually, no, I do have an idea. It does have center scan, not even with an upgrade. It will come with a center scan option. It's already built into the camera and it can be switched on and off with the press of one button. You also have a really clever clear image zoom function with the camera that turns a prime lens into a uh, variable zoom. You can actually zoom in and out um, by up to two times in HD and 1.5 times in 4K and this is much, much better than your old-fashioned uh, digital image zoom because it's actually a database of um, textures and things like that in the camera that the camera looks up so it knows exactly how to process the image based on what you're shooting. How does the look compare to an F5? Well, it is similar, but it isn't the same. The processing in this camera is not as good as that of the F5. The F5 can and will produce a slightly better image, but it, it's, it's close. It's very, very close. Um, Will it meet 4K broadcast spec with an external recorder? No, it won't because it's still only 8-bit. The output in UHD is 8-bit. It's limited to 8-bit. 4K UHD broadcast is 10-bit, 422. Yeah, there's no point in shooting in 4K if you're going to do it in 8-bit. So it's you know, you have this, why, this is why I say this camera isn't really a digital cinema camera. Um, will the zoom track and keep focus on the Sony lenses? Yes, it's not. 100% perfect, but it's 90%, 95% there. These are still DSLR lenses, so they're not absolutely perfect, but you have to consider that you're looking at a thousand pound lens compared to a, a 35, 40,000 pound lens, so you have to sort of set your expectations at the right point. How do the high ISO clips look? Do they look more filmic or more organic like, or more like video? It's actually very filmic, especially if you shoot it in UHD because the pixels are very small relative to the size of the frame. So you get very fine, very small noise. It's quite a filmic looking noise. One of the things I really like about the camera, um, if I skip on a bit, actually uh, this shot here taken Amsterdam at night, F4 lens, I'm and uh, in the dark available light and it's quite a nice look. This was shot with a Cine Gamma um, as opposed to Log, so it's straight out of the camera. That's how it looks and it handled very mixed lighting and some really difficult lighting switch situations really well. Um, cool tricks that the camera can do. We can control the focus, shutter, white balance, ISO, gain, aperture from the joystick on the hand grip and that's a really cool function. It's a, called a quick menu function and you press uh, a sign on button 5 on the hand grip, you will see the focus, shutter, white balance, ISO highlighted on the viewfinder and you can use the little thumbstick on the on the hand grip to shuttle between each of those functions and control them. And a really cool thing is if you are using a Sony lens is that you can actually pull the focus nearer or further away using that little thumbstick. Really good, cool thing to have. Now, lots of questions um, about picture quality and um, image quality. Um, I'm just going to go through some of these. Um, so how good is the autofocus? I'm coming from a Canon 305, so this will be my first camera this style. Uh, good question. It's going to be different. It's not going to be as good. One of the things with a small sensor camera, third inch sensors, is they're very forgiving of focus inaccuracies because you have very deep depth of field. When you go to a large sensor camera, your focus must be much more precise. And as a result, the focus performance tends to feel inferior. Um, it just doesn't feel as good, and that's because it's 
generally a bit slower because it has to be much more precise, has to be much more accurate. Is there an industry preference over the FS5 over a conveyor like C300? Who knows? It's too, nobody's got one yet. We, that, that can't be said. C300 is now getting quite long in the tooth. That's much more limited dynamic range and other things. It's an older camera and also a much, much more expensive camera. C300 Mark II is almost three times the price of the FS5. We'll have to wait and see. That only time will tell what will happen there. Um, how much better would the image be if I used the lens from the FS7K? Well, it's not going to be better. You'll get a different zoom range. Optically, there's very little difference between the zoom lenses. I actually prefer the 18 to 105 that's going to come um, with the FS5. I think it is um, a, a better um, a, a better camera, a better system. Um, what is the speed? Uh, we've cut down that one. Can you control the camera's function over length and Wi-Fi? Um, not over LAN. You can't control the camera over LAN, but you can remotely control the camera over Wi-Fi if you have the remote control app on your um, iPhone, Android device, and things like that. And you have quite a bit of control. Yes, you, with a Sony lens, you can control zoom, focus, iris, um, put it into record, and things like that. Um, which is uh, really quite nice. The variable ND can be controlled via LANC if you um, plug in the hand grip. Um, I'm not quite sure how that's going to work with third-party controllers at this point, but it's purely a LANC protocol, and of course you can always unplug the hand grip or take the hand grip off the camera, put an Arri rosette on it and get a clamp to make, put it on a tripod arm and things like that if you want to use it um, on a tripod. Will it match a PMW 500? Uh, kind of. Most Sony cameras have very similar colorimetry, so they all have very similar looks. But obviously the PMW 500 is a CCD camera, three sensor with a big optical block. So you have chromatic aberration, all sorts of things from that optical block. They're going to look different no matter how you try and match them electronically because they are different optically. Um, they're not going to be a million miles apart, but they're very different types of cameras, so they are going to look um, quite different. Is there a roadmap to include HDR? Well, it includes HDR anyway. You have to understand that HDR is actually a display technology. HDR isn't about cameras. HDR is about displays. So HDR, high dynamic range, is about being able to show a large dynamic range, and currently HDR monitoring goes up to about 12 stops of dynamic range with OLED panels and about 10 or 11 stops with LCD. Now, because the camera can record S-Log2 and S-Log3 in 14 stops, it's already recording a high dynamic range image. So all you'll need to do is adjust your post-production workflow, get an HDR monitor so you can see what your finished grade looks like, and work on it that way. So you'll shoot S-Log2, S-Log3, grade it for a HDR monitor, and that will give you HDR. It doesn't have the same color space, um, unfortunately, as, say, the F55 cameras like that. So color space is going to be a little bit limited, but it's certainly 95% of the way there to um, HDR. Um, I've been asked to go back to the FS7K lens. Well, a lens is a lens. It's 28 to, 135, uh, 28 to 135, so you put it on this camera, it's a 28 to 135 millimeter lens um, with the same zoom function and everything else as you have on the FS7. Um, the lens that comes with the FS5 kit is um, 18 to 104, so you get an 18 to 104 power zoom lens. Um, both are f4 um, because it has the correction for any defects in either lens. Both look very similar, very similar performance. Um, if you output put your projects in 1080, would you record in 4K on the FS5 or 1080? I would always, if I have a 4K camera, shoot in 4K. You can reframe. You can do image stabilization. Your noise, the structure of your noise, your grain will be much finer. There are so many things. I mean, one of the things I do a lot with corporate videos is shoot in 4K, do an interview, do a mid shot, and then from that mid shot, of course, you have a close up. Uh, or if you do a wide shot, you can even squeeze out a mid and a close up shot from one single shot, so it looks like a three camera shoot. The extra penalty from shooting in 4K over HD is, is purely how much space you're going to use on your SD cards. Um, and SD cards are cheap, so I would always prefer to shoot in 4K whenever I can. There is obviously the question of workflow as well. You're going to have to test that on your own computers to see 
you know, how much of a problem that is, you can always transcode to ProRes or something like that if you need to, if your computer isn't up to editing XAVCL. Um, for shooting high-end corporates or large screen projection, would you stick to an FS7 or F5? Well, I own both of those. Um, I would always, on a big screen projection project, I would always use my F5. Um, it gives the best image quality. Um, the F5 is a much easier to camera to shoot with, the way the, the um, control panel on the side of the camera, that look up that screen, that LCD panel on the side of the F5 allows you to see what you're doing much more easily in terms of any lookup tables, gain and stuff like that. I always, always prefer the, FS, the F5. Second best would be FS7, this would be third best. But it's, you know, it's a cheap camera. It's not an expensive camera, so if, if you can't afford an FS7 or F5, it's going to be great for those kinds of productions. And to be honest, will the viewer notice it? I doubt it. It's such a small difference. So obviously F5, FS7 is better, but the difference isn't enormous. Uh, just um, we had a few questions about if, if the video here on, on the actual webinar, um, as I think I mentioned at the beginning, members, you weren't there, that there is audio, but um, you will get slides. Um, you, you yeah. Know, to, to, to the audio, so you'll. There's, there's only, only, only the PowerPoint slides. There's no live video um, with this. Um, mentioned earlier, so I'm just going through questions. I've got lots of slides here, but there's so many questions coming in. I'm going to try and answer as many uh, questions as possible. Um, one of the questions here is. Um, I mentioned earlier that you should shoot two stops over in certain conditions. Can I explain that further? Well, really, that's something you want to come to the seminar, to the masterclass for, where, where all of that will be explained in great depth, because it's, it's something that needs to be explained properly so that people understand it. But basically, especially when you're shooting in UHD or 4K with this camera, because it's only going to be 8-bit, if you are underexposed even remotely, your noise will be incredibly grainy because there is going to be very, very little data down here in the shadows. So whenever you shoot, and this actually applies to any camera, whenever you're shooting in um, S-Log, so this is um, an S-Log uh, frame grab here from the camera, this is um, actually exposed about a stopover nominal, um, sorry, there's the original, so that's the um, ungraded S-Log, it's about a stopover the nominal correct exposure, when you grade it, you get a really nice looking image. You always, with log, and it's the same actually with F5, FS7, want to be overexposed rather than under. The moment you are underexposed, you will introduce very coarse grain into the image. And what has to be remembered with S, any S-log workflow is it's a workflow that involves post-production. You are going to manipulate the image in post-production, and the thing that will limit how much you can um, manipulate your image in post more than anything else is noise, noise and grain. So you overexpose by between one and two stops. That minimizes your noise and grain. You get a brighter picture, so your noise and grain is lower. That means you can grade much more freely, much more. And because you have 14 stops of dynamic range, even if you're shooting two stops overexposed, you still have more highlight and overexposure range than you would have with the vast majority of traditional cameras, so you don't need to worry about your highlights. And this is something that is really important with these high dynamic range large sensor cameras, is people need to stop worrying about highlights. If you expose the mid-range correctly or between one and two stops over, the highlights will still be fine because there's so much dynamic range up there that even if you have got a bit of overexposure or clipping, the footage will be rolling off very gently into those highlights. You're not going to have a problem with them. Even if they are overexposed, they will look naturally overexposed because even our own vision doesn't have unlimited dynamic range. And there's no monitor or TV that can show those highlights accurately anyway, so they're going to have to be graded and treated to, to fit in the limited display range. So shooting with a large dynamic range camera like this, you have to completely rechange the way you work. Traditional video cameras, we're drummed into our brains all the time. Protect your highlights, protect your highlights. You know, if it overexposes, it looks ugly. And that's very true of traditional limited dynamic range cameras. 
a typical video camera, even a really good one like an FS, a PMW 500 or even the new X500, two third inch camera like that, has only got an 11 stop dynamic range. I mean, I say 11 is quite a lot, but you have to remember that 14 stops is 400% more. It's not just a little bit more, it's massively more dynamic range. And as a result, the highlights when they do overexpose normally look okay. There's no way we can show them anyway, so don't worry about them. What you need to worry about is noise and grain in your shadows, what your shadows and the darker parts and even the mid-range of the picture look like, because that's what's going to limit how much you can grade, and that's what's going to limit what you can do with your footage and how good it's going to look in post-production when it's finished. So you really, really need to sort of rethink the way you shoot. Um, um, what other questions have we got? Um, can I tell you anything about rumoured FS RAW? Well, it's not just rumoured, it is official that there will be um, a upgrade for this camera that will allow you to get a RAW signal out of the camera, and that RAW signal can then be recorded on an external recorder, so you can actually get 12-bit linear RAW from the camera, so that will get you the 12-bit that you need if you if you do need to do broadcast 4K or UHD with the camera, but you're going to have to use an external RAW recorder to do it. And 12-bit RAW, well, it's not nearly as nice as 16-bit RAW. It tends to be a bit grainy and noisy in the shadows because there isn't enough data down there in the shadows. There is this crazy, crazy rumor going around that somehow it's going to record RAW onto SD cards. Um, I know nothing officially. Um, what I would say about that is... I think anyone that thinks you can record RAW at 4K onto an SD card is in fantasy land because, yeah, but it technically it's possible, but it's going to have to be so highly compressed, it will be so full of compression artifacts that it will probably be just about ungradable. I mean, these are SD cards, for goodness sake. You can't, there's only so much data you can put on an SD card. Possibly FS7 record RAW onto the XQD cards. That is conceivable. I still doubt it but certainly not onto SD cards with an FS5. I really, really don't think that would ever happen. Um, are there any software updates planned that will be, bring new features? Well, yeah, that's one of the nice things about these cameras that can be updated by software and by firmware is that new features do tend to come out over time for them. I don't quite know what you would add to this camera. It's very, very well featured right out of the box. Um, so we will see the things like the HDMI thing being resolved and, and a few other things like that, but I don't really think that um, you're going to see a huge range of other features. It's already got center crop mode, it's already got slow motion, it's already got the things that we've had to wait for on some of the other cameras that have um, come from Sony. I mean, talking about slow motion, so it's very similar um, to the FS700 in so much as, again, with this very limited amount of data you can write to an SD card. So instead of writing the slow motion directly to the SD card, it's written to a memory in the camera. That memory has a limited amount of space, so it works in bursts. If you're shooting 240 frames per second in HD, it's full HD, but you're limited to an eight second uh, recording period and then the camera copies that eight seconds of slow motion footage from its internal memory to the SD card. I actually really like that system. It's really good for unexpected stuff, so a soccer match or thunderstorm, point it where the action is going to happen and wait for the action to happen, and then you can use the end trigger function to take the eight seconds prior to the action happening. So it takes that eight seconds before you hit record and copies that to the card. So it's really good for unexpected uh, events and things like that that you, you don't really know uh, when it's going to happen. Is there an internal frame recording function? No, currently there isn't. Frame recording is much, much harder to do with a long GOP codec. So whether that will ever come or not, I don't know. Now, my suspicion with this camera actually is that it's using the same processing internally as the um, A7S Mark II. So my gut feeling with this camera is it's basically an FS7 sensor feeding into A7S Mark II processing. If you look at the feature set and the way it does things, if you look at the limitations on output, like 8-bit, 420 in UHD, and long-op-only codec, 
it all seems to fit that that's what's going on with this camera. So, um, and um, not necessarily a bad thing. So actually, I think the image processing in the A7, um, A7R and A7S Mark II is actually really, really nice. It gives a really nice image. Um, but there are limitations to what that processing can do, um, to what you can actually get out of that processing circuitry, and that's how they managed to get this very low power consumption um, that I mentioned before. We're going to wrap up um, in a minute. Uh, we're, we're, we are running out of, of time. Um, so network functions quickly. Um, PXW FS5 it has NFC, so very easy to pair with an NFC device. Has Wi-Fi and a LAN port on the back. FTP via Wi-Fi or Ethernet via the hardwire connection. You can FTP XAVC proxy, the full resolution XAVC L, and the AVC HD files because it has um, AVC HD as well. You can stream over the Wi-Fi or Ethernet, and that streaming signal is compatible with the Teradek Cube, so you can stream directly to. A Teradek Cube receiver, plug that receiver into your TV or monitor for a, a live link. And then the camera control and monitoring is done with Content Browser mobile application, and that allows you to control the majority of the functions and features of the camera. It has the MI shoe on the top of the hand grip that allows you to feed in uh, extra audio. So if you're using the Sony UWPD radio mic, you get the little adapter, the SMAD P3. It's only what, 30 pounds or something like that. That adapter is very cheap. And then you can dock the microphone to the camera. It then powers the receiver and feeds the audio into the camera. There are two XLR connectors on the camera. There's one on the hand grip and one on the camera body at the back as well. So you do have two XLR inputs. And the camera only has two audio channels. So even if you do add the UWPD receiver, you can't record more than two audio channels, so you're still limited to two channels of audio. The FS5, I think this camera is going to be a big star, and if sort of pre-orders are anything to go by, I think that certainly seems to be indicated. There's lots and lots of pre-orders coming in, because you can hold it in one hand, zoom in and out. You, know, you can use the clear image zoom function to turn a prime into a two-time zoom. Um, one push autofocus to, to fine-tune or finesse your focus if you need to. Um, silky smooth, really beautiful control over exposure thanks to the ND filter without the depth of field changing. And it really is an eye opener when you see that function. If you put two cameras side by side and you do an exposure change via aperture and exposure change via ND, the, the exposure change via aperture really leaps out at you as that depth of field changes. Do it via the ND and it, it's much, much less noticeable. Really good low light performance because it's 3200 ISO native in S log 2 and S log 3 and 1000 ISO in all the other gammas. You have cine gammas, so really controllable to get really good dynamic range without having the complexity of an S log 2 workflow. And cheap media, SDXC cards for UHD, they're really cheap these days. I mean, you can get them just about anywhere. Pick them up in the airport if you're going somewhere and you run out of media. So it, you, know, you should never really run out of media. Two model variations. There is a kit um, that comes with the 18 to 105 millimeter lens. My recommendation would be go with the kit. It doesn't add a lot of extra cost to the price, and the lens is actually quite a nice lens. I actually prefer this 18 to 105 over the 28 to 135. It's it's wider, and that's what you need on a handheld camera. You need a wide lens, not a long lens. But if you don't want the lens, you can buy it uh, body only. Um, I'll put this table up very quickly, um, just while we're sort of wrapping up, so you can have a look. I'll come back in a minute. Plug that seminar one more time, in <laughs> case you haven't known. In case you haven't um, noticed, we're doing a seminar here. I'll be here, and we'll go into that whole exposure thing. We'll look at cine gammas, when to use them, how to expose them correctly. Then we'll go into log. We'll go into post-production a little bit and how you can maximize your log post-production workflow and all those sorts of things. I think it would be a really, really beneficial day. If you're thinking of getting one of these cameras and you really want to get the most out of it, it's, it's worth coming because you, you're going to learn a lot and you can ask questions face-to-face. -face. I'm here for the whole day and I always, always in my workshops try and answer everybody's questions because that I think is one of the most important things is to answer the questions that people have. So while... Um, Rob uh, quickly wraps up. I'm going to shovel the, shove my laptop over to him because we're using the laptop's mic. Um, 
Over to you, Rob. Okay, thanks very much, Alistair. Brilliant as always. Um, if we didn't manage to answer any of your questions, we will be doing that via email directly too, so don't worry. Um, thanks for your patience. We had a few technical issues with the provider today, but hopefully the information sort of was worth hanging on for, and I'm, I'm sure it was. So thanks again for listening.